There's a broad and general notion that ultraviolet radiation or UV light is a carcinogen. A carcinogen is an agent that has the potential to cause cancer or increase the chances of getting cancer in living organisms, including humans. So does ultraviolet light meet the criteria for a carcinogen? Well, ultraviolet light can lead to DNA damage and other types of damage that are seen in cancerous cells and in various types of skin cancer. But does that make it a carcinogen? Well, many of my colleagues seem to believe that that is the case. In this video, I'd like to air some of my concerns regarding categorizing ultraviolet light as a carcinogen and provide a balanced approach moving forward on how to handle sun exposure responsibly. So ultraviolet light is an invisible spectrum of light that is naturally emitted by the sun. It is divided into three categories, ultraviolet A, ultraviolet B, and ultraviolet C. Ultraviolet A, which ranges between 321 nanometers and 400 nanometers. Ultraviolet B, which ranges between 290 and 320 nanometers and ultraviolet C, whose range is between 280 nanometers and 100 nanometers. Incidentally, ultraviolet C does not reach the Earth, so we are left to contend with ultraviolet A and ultraviolet B. So ultraviolet A and ultraviolet B can both reach the skin and can both induce DNA damage and other types of damage in cells that are found in skin cancer. So that sounds like a pretty done deal, meaning those types of ultraviolet light reach the skin, cause the damage, the damage translates into cell damage, the damaged cells eventually turn into cancer, end of story, right? That's a done deal? Well, not so fast. Let's take a look at the facts. It's a glaring oversight that the majority of people in the world do not get skin cancer. And that is the vast majority of the world. That includes, obviously, people of African descent, people of Asian descent, people of South American descent, and including people of Caucasian descent, meaning of European descent. The majority of these people do not get skin cancer. And we're talking about people who have been exposed to sun for a prolonged period of times, some people experience sunburns, some people tan for all their lives, and yet the majority of people do not get skin cancer. Now what's interesting is that most of the world does not have what we have in the Western world, the type of awareness to sun exposure and to the possible risk of sun exposure and ultraviolet radiation. So with that lack of awareness, it is interesting to note that, that most people across the world do not get skin cancer, let alone deadly skin cancer, with much less awareness than we have in the Western world. That is not to say that skin cancer is not a major problem. It is more common than any other type of cancer. So certainly skin cancer awareness, early detection, and how to deal with it is of paramount importance. And we'll get to that at the end of the video. So speaking of skin cancer, this is a very versatile category of conditions. There are basal cell carcinomas, which are the most common type of skin cancer, followed by squamous cell carcinomas, which are the second most common type, followed by malignant melanoma, which is the third most common type. And then there are more rare types of skin cancer, such as Merkel cell carcinoma, which is the type of cancer that Jimmy Buffett, the late Jimmy Buffett, may rest in peace, died from. But, as I said, most people don't get it. Why is that? Well, the reason why not everybody gets skin cancer is ultimately very complex. Every person is different from the next, and they have different sets of circumstances, life circumstances, different genetics, and different environmental factors that are weighing in on whether or not they're going to get this cancer or another or not get cancer at all. But let's look at some specific facts here. So DNA damage is sort of a very nebulous term. For a cell to reach cancerous potential, there must be enough DNA damage, what we call critical mass DNA damage, to cause enough changes in the cell biology and make it go off the rails and become cancerous. So that's not something that every cell that gets hit with ultraviolet radiation actually experiences or goes through. If you've enjoyed this video so far, hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, share this video with people you love, and put a comment in the comment section. Now, interestingly enough, mutations are not a one-way street. So mutations that are caused by ultraviolet light and other factors do actually have mechanisms inside each healthy cell that attempt to correct them. These are robust mechanisms. They are continuously at play correcting known mutations that are caused by ultraviolet light and other factors. 
and those are consistently correcting mutations. Obviously, this is not a perfect foolproof system, so some mutations get by. However, this system continuously corrects mutations that are created by ultraviolet light, so this is not a one-way street. There's another category of mechanisms that are called autophagy. Autophagy is a category or a family of mechanisms that are designed to detect cell damage, some of which is caused by ultraviolet light, some of which is called by many other factors, and correct those damages. Now, this goes beyond DNA. This goes into correcting cell organelles or parts of cells that are defective and ultimately can actually take notice of a whole cell that's gone defective and reached a critical mass, inducing programmed cell death. So that is something that can actually stop a cell in its tracks and make it undergo programmed cell death or apoptosis. Finally, there's the immune system. The immune system is a constant surveillance mechanism that looks for things that are not right. Sometimes infectious organisms, but the immune system also looks for cells that are defective. The immune system can detect cells that have undergone significant changes and in those cases, many of those cells are taken out by the immune system, which makes those cells, again, auto-destruct and go through programmed cell death. So with damage that's caused by ultraviolet light, and that's certainly an issue, a lot of the damage that is caused by ultraviolet light and other factors, by the way, besides ultraviolet light, is actually constantly surveilled by the body, various mechanisms inside the cells and outside the cells by way of the immune system, there's a constant attempt to correct DNA damage as well as other cell damage by intracellular mechanisms as well as extracellular mechanisms that are the immune system. Second, and this is very important, ultraviolet radiation has many great benefits for human biology. Specifically, we're talking about production of vitamin D in the skin. We're talking about release of nitric oxide and lowering the blood pressure, mood enhancement, amelioration of pain, decrease of death from colon cancer and breast cancer, as well as prostate cancer. In addition, ultraviolet light has been shown to decrease the risk for multiple sclerosis, as well as diabetes. Now, this is likely a very short list of benefits as we are learning more and more about the benefits of sunlight exposure, specifically ultraviolet radiation. Third, there is a very important issue to discuss. We do not fully realize or understand the full effect of using sunblock on the skin. What do I mean by that? So interestingly, sunblock sounds like a pretty simple concept. You just slather it on your skin, block off UV radiation, and you're good to go, correct? Well, not so fast. It's actually not that simple. First of all, sunblock does not block ultraviolet radiation uniformly. Even the broad blockers allow certain portions of the wavelength to penetrate more easily than others, so there's an uneven distribution of ultraviolet light penetration. What does that do to the skin and skin biology? We don't fully understand, but it's clearly something that's not well understood. So that could be a problem. The other thing is, many of the ingredients in sunblock products may have adverse effects, specifically skin irritation, and allergenicity, and some of them may actually affect the body internally, such as effects on the endocrinological system. And that is still a matter of active research, meaning we're still finding out more about sunblock ingredients and their effects on human biology. This is largely overlooked, is that we don't fully understand the interaction of sunblock with the microbiome, which is a recently acknowledged or recently realized concept in human biology. This is the full microbial population that lives on people's skin. And while we don't fully understand the role or the importance of the microbiome, we do understand that there are important roles to this factor on the skin. But we don't know the full story about sunblock and the microbiome. There is evidence that titanium dioxide and zinc oxide as food additives have effects on the gut microbiome. I would not assume that sunblock ingredients do not affect the microbiome, and I would not dismiss concerns about those effects on the microbiome. And finally, sunblock's main proclaimed function, which is prevention or lowering the risk of skin cancer, is not watertight. There are studies out there that show some protective qualities to sunblock using sunblock against certain types of skin cancer, and then there are other types of studies that do not show that benefit. So this is still debatable, but we're not really sure what sort of effects does sunblock have on preventing skin cancer. Now, some dermatologists are going to tell you 
The science is settled. Everything points to the fact that sunblock is a watertight way of preventing skin cancer. This is simply not true. There's evidence to suggest that it does. There's evidence to suggest that it, that it does not. And we still don't have the full picture. My guess is that there are likely some cases in which sunblock may lower the risk for skin cancer, but I'd say this is something that's individually determined, probably based on individual genetics, individual circumstances of life, and individual application of sunblock, including what type of sunblock they chose. And this is something that is highly complicated and is very, very difficult to investigate and make any broad proclamations about. So I'd say actually the science is not settled about sunblock's ability to prevent or lower the risk for skin cancer in the first place. Now, interestingly, despite a massive decades long campaign in the Western world, including Australia and New Zealand, the rates of skin cancer have been gradually increasing over the past few decades. What could be reasons behind that? Well, first of all, there is the claim that the population is aging and skin cancer developed later in life. That could be part of it. Another possibility is that we're detecting skin cancers earlier because there's a greater awareness amongst dermatologists and a greater awareness amongst people generally. So they show up earlier at the dermatologist's office and we're detecting more of these tumors. Another possibility is that there is some other factor or, or a number of other factors that have entered the environment and are causing increased rates of skin cancer. And the other less popular possibility is that sunblock application in some way is contributing to that as well. That is something that has not been corroborated or proven, but that being said, it is a possibility. So with everything I've just laid out, I'd say this. I think ultraviolet light does have a role in certain cases of skin cancer. This is very complex. There are many different factors that can weigh in and actually affect the outcome, meaning whether or not a person gets skin cancer or not. I would say that the hypothesis of ultraviolet light causing skin cancer was conveniently turned into an assertion which is thought to apply across the board. That is not the case. I do think that ultraviolet light does cause certain skin cancer cases but I don't think it's a universal carcinogen and the benefits of ultraviolet light known and unknown are way too important to just toss out the window in favor of ultimate protection from ultraviolet light. I do think we need some moderation in the approach to sun exposure and that is what I'm about to do next. If you've enjoyed this video so far, please share, like, and subscribe. Put a comment in the comment section. So the bottom line from my perspective is that ultraviolet light may lead to changes that can ultimately result in skin cancer, but I would not categorize it as a carcinogen. I think it is a natural factor that is essential for human life on many different levels, considering what we've just talked about regarding the benefits of exposure to ultraviolet light. That being said, that needs to be taken in moderation. Now, how do we establish moderation? Let's take a look. Well, the good news is, is that there's plenty you can do to moderate sun exposure, get the benefits, and not get the side effects of excessive sun exposure. How do we do that? First, be hypervigilant with early detection of skin cancer. That goes without saying. So you have to know how to recognize early signs of skin cancer. For more information about early detection of skin cancer, check out my video at the link above. So, Obviously, there are problems that are inherent to excessive sun exposure. Let's look at the problems. First of all, continuous and excessive sun exposure can lead to sun damage. Sun damage can show up as wrinkles, as freckling, as other discoloration, and that leads to premature aging of the skin, and that makes the skin look bad and old and weathered. So that's something you probably want to avoid. Another problem is that ultraviolet light may actually, in some cases, be associated with formation of skin cancer. So obviously avoiding excessive sunlight can contribute to prevention of cancer in certain cases. Not all, I'd say, but certain cases. Also, there is an addictive element to sun exposure with release of endorphins in the skin in relation to ultraviolet B. So that could be a problem as well. It obviously has accompanying issues such as skin aging and potential contribution to skin cancer. So how do we moderate sun exposure? Well, let's talk about sensible sun exposure. Sensible sun exposure was coined by a physician named Dr. Michael Hollick, who is a vitamin D expert. And Michael Hollick calculated the minimal exposure to sunlight that would get one their daily vitamin D requirement. 
Dr. Hawley calculated that if one gets a third of their minimal erythemal dose unprotected, they would actually get their daily vitamin D requirement. And after that, it is recommended that people actually do use some form of sun protection. What is minimal erythemal dose? Well, the minimal erythemal dose is the amount of exposure to sunlight or ultraviolet radiation that gets the skin, the exposed skin, a little pink the next day, meaning a minimal sunburn. Dr. Hollick's recommendations are to get a third of that, meaning don't get anywhere deep tanning, don't get obviously anywhere near sunburn. So knowingly, do not get sunburned, do not get deeply tanned, but get that little exposure to ultraviolet radiation that will get you your vitamin D's worth and also other benefits that are associated with exposure to ultraviolet light. And that translates to this. If your minimal erythemal dose is about one hour, you need to get about 20 minutes of exposure unprotected. And then following that, protect yourself from the sun, either by means of physical protection, meaning get out of the sun altogether, get under an umbrella, use sun protective clothing, or use sunblock over the areas if you can't afford to use any physical protection if that's not in the cards. Now, what sort of sunblock should you use? Now, that's a very complicated question because there are many different products and many different ingredients that are used for sunblocking. My recommendation is to use a broad spectrum blocker. I specifically like zinc oxide. It is found in many different products that are offered in the market. The thing about zinc oxide is that it is pasty white, meaning when you paint it on the skin, it's going to paint your skin pasty white. So easy with the layers, you actually need to apply a visible layer of the sunblock and it will look a little white and pasty. You will get your broad spectrum protection for both ultraviolet B and ultraviolet A and you'll look a little pasty white. So that's the price you have to pay for that. If you like any other sunblock product that doesn't irritate your skin, I'd say that's fine too. Again, there's so much evidence to suggest many different things about sunblock ingredients. The ones that are out there are usually deemed safe by the body of evidence that we have. You can't cover all bases. That is an impossibility. So I'd say if you like a product and it does actually confer sun protection to you, use that product. Remember, then many sunblock products need to be reapplied to reinforce the sun protective element of the product. So the bottom line is ultraviolet light I don't think is a carcinogen. I do think that it has the potential to contribute to cancer, but the advantages and benefits of sunlight exposure, including ultraviolet light, completely outweigh the risks that are associated with sunlight exposure. So we want to use moderation. Expose yourself to sunlight in moderation so you don't get sunburned, certainly, and you don't get deeply tanned, but you get those benefits, and at the same time, you're going to get your sun exposure and your benefits. Well, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, hit the like and subscribe button. Share this video with the ones you love. Thank you again for watching, and God bless.